You know all about the Bell Witch and the Salem Witch Trials, but I know you've never heard of the woman who destroyed an entire city 20 years after her death. And unless you want to be cursed by the Witch of Yuzu yourself, <laughs> I suggest you hit that like button so we can get into the story. In 1977, recently elected President of the United States, Jimmy Carter visited the city of Yazoo, Mississippi. And while he was there, Jimmy Carter noticed lights in the cemetery at night. And because he had read Willie Morris's novel, The Good Old Boys, he knew he had to protect the witch's grave at all cost. And so he fearlessly marched into the cemetery in the middle of the night to arrest anyone who dare vandalize the grave of a woman who once burned the entire city to the ground back in 1904. Don't believe me? It's true. Well, it's, it's kind of true. Let me explain. You see, President Jimmy Carter really did visit Yazoo City, and during his visit, Jimmy Carter really did enter the cemetery at night to protect the grave of a famous Yazooan witch. Except it was Officer Jimmy Carter, who was on patrol around the cemetery that night, not President Jimmy Carter. But this did in fact happen Well, President Jimmy Carter was in town. I know, it's really funny. But anyway, Officer Carter tracked down these vandals, caught up with them, and he shone his light on the group of no-good hooligans and shouted at them to stop. The group complied. They turned around, and Officer Carter got a good look at their faces, and it was President Jimmy Carter. I mean, it was it was uh, Willie Morris, the author who made the legend of the Witch of Yazoo famous just years prior with his novel, The Good Old Boys. Morris was in town doing a write-up on the presidential visit, and since this was his old stomping ground, and as a teenager, he, like me, loved walking through cemeteries at night. Is there something wrong with me? And he was there with his nephew, and he had dared him to walk to the witch's grave at night alone and touch it. He was just there to point him in the right direction. Anyway, they weren't vandals, and the situation was resolved innocently enough. But Officer Carter had been on high alert because of recent vandalism in the cemetery, including vandalism of the witch's grave itself. Which, if you know anything about the Witch of Yazoo, you know that vandalizing her grave comes with, shall we say, significant consequences. You see, the Witch's grave in the Yazoo City Cemetery is a grave of real import to the community. There are signs leading to her unique resting place all throughout, and when you find it, you'll see that it's overgrown with grass and broken into three distinct parts, embedded into the ground, fallen from its once upright position with a large, rusty, chain-link fence often lying on the grass around it. The headstone states, According to local legend, on May 25th, 1904, the witch of Yazoo City broke out of these curious chain links surrounding her grave and burned down Yazoo City. Writer Willie Morris's classic Good Old Boy brought national renown to this vengeful woman and her shameful deed. Originally named Manchester, in 1841, citizens voted to change the name of the city to Yazoo City in honor of the Yazoo River system it built on the banks of. Just imagine if your city changed its name to Kalamazoo or Yankee Doodle, but, but the river was vital to the city's successful economy, so they felt it justified. It shipped 25,000 bales of cotton out every year. By 1885, the business district was booming, and the city's population exceeded 3,000 people, among whom was a woman who didn't quite get along with the other citizens of Yazoo. In fact, it's said that the unnamed woman was vehemently disliked, called ugly and evil, an outcast who eventually made her home on the outskirts of town in the swampy regions of the river. She was not particularly welcome at Yazoo City, which at one point was considered the most beautiful city on the Delta. And she would largely be ignored even when fishermen who frequented the river started to disappear. This is where legend tries to sneak its way into the history books. You see, during stormy nights, when fishermen were caught out on the river trying to make it to shelter, the woman would appear on the banks of the river, beckoning them to come into her home for shelter. And if the fishermen were really desperate, they would take her up on her offer, and it was only when they were inside would she, under some unknown force, overpower them, bind them, and torture them 
to death. After so many people went missing, whispers about the woman started circulating. People began to think that maybe she was responsible, but no one had any proof. That is, until one evening in 1884, a boy named Joe Bob Duggett was rafting along the Yazoo River when he heard a horrible, ungodly moan. Quickly, he noted that there was a rundown house on the banks and tied his raft to a cypress branch. He ran to the house, and through the windows, he peeked in. His eyes widened, and his blood ran cold at what he saw. It was the old woman in a black dress. She was dancing around the corpses of two dead men stretched out on the floor. She danced about them and sang in terrible incantations while waving her arms in wild circles. Terrified, Joe raced to his raft and made it to town and went straight to the sheriff, upon which the sheriff and his deputies raced to the witch's house and upon entering, didn't find the men, but horrifyingly they found other rotting corpses hidden in the rafters. Then they heard hissing and scratching, and as they went upstairs, they entered the bedroom and found dozens of starving cats locked in the bedroom, gyrating in cat-like agitation and insanity. Then suddenly, breaking branches were heard outside. The sheriff turned and looked out the upstairs window to see the disheveled woman running away into the swamp. Stop! In the name of the law, he shouted, but she disappeared into the thicket, and they pursued. Joe Duggett remembered the woman looking like half a ghost and half a scarecrow as she fled wildly into the brush. At first, it appeared that she had gotten away, but suddenly they happened upon her, sinking up to her neck in quicksand. But before they could rescue her, she sank beneath the sand and wretchedly gurgled out with her last breath. I shall return. Everybody always hated me here. I will break out of my grave and burn down the whole town on the morning of May 25th, 1904. Then, as Joe described it later, with a gurgle and a wretch, the woman sank from sight to her just deserts. The witch had died on May 25th, 1884. The authorities retrieved her body, and with the rain sweeping down from the hills, they buried her in the center of the town cemetery in the midst of a bunch of bushes, with an original headstone that just said T.W. The T.W. could have been initials, but it became known simply as The Witch. For good measure, the sheriff also wrapped a large, thick chain around her grave, using the largest chains they could get, some thirty strong and solid links, and speaking of the witch's restless spirit, the sheriff said almost mockingly at her grave, if she can break through this chain, she deserves to burn the city. Then the years went by, Yazoo flourished. People flocked to the city to see its sights and natural beauty. Business boomed and people forgot about the witch, all but a few sextons who remained diligent in tending to her grave, keeping it up and making sure the chain always remained in good repair. Then came the fateful day of May 25th, 1904. Twenty years to the day, a boy, around 8 a.m., was playing with matches underneath his house when an ember caught hold of a dry weed and a blaze was sprung. The boy ran, and in a moment his poor house was engulfed in flames. Shouts of fire rang out in the streets within moments, and men were springing into action to extinguish it. But no sooner than the first pail of water was tossed onto the house, a deadly and almost supernatural wind picked up out of nowhere and swept the blaze to the neighboring house. More citizens rushed to help. The fire twisted and jumped through the air to the next house, and then to the next, and then to the next, until it was taking hold of the business district. It was a still, calm morning, but no sooner than the fire began did the winds pick up harshly to help spread the inferno, so much so that eyewitnesses claimed that a supernatural force was ravaging the city. An hour went by and the blaze was raging. A startling message flashed across the wires from Yazoo. Yazoo City is being swept from the face of the earth, it said. Mr. W. H. Hughes wrote of the fire. Morning, 8 a.m., May 25th. The beautiful city of Yazoo, the pride of its citizens, a garden spot in the Delta. Afternoon, 2 p.m. A crumbling mass of tangled wires and miles of debris. The roar of the flames, the crash of falling buildings, explosions, 
The shrieks of hysterical women, the hoarse shouts of the men, and the blinding smoke made a regular inferno. N.A. Mott noted, Oh, how it went on the wings of the wind from one end of the city to the other, then back again as if wishing to tantalize before destroying, and mocking at all human effort. The flames would leap from house to house and from block to block, like a tiger springing upon its prey. No pen can describe, no tongue can utter the dismay and horror of those hours. He went on to note that it was comparatively a greater disaster than the great Chicago fire. It is true that Chicago lost her hundreds of millions, while well, Yazoo City lost only her millions, yet Chicago did not come so near to losing her all. But will Yazoo be rebuilt? Yes, she will rise from the ashes, phoenix-like. Reverend J.M. Weems reported, I then called Mrs. Weems, that our home and church were doomed and that our only way of escape was through the church to Washington Street. As we passed through the church, the windows in the Sunday school room were on fire from the intense heat. I then stood on the street and saw my happy home with all its contents and our beautiful church melt in the flames as though they had been built of paper. Our beautiful city is not dead, he said, but only sleeps after the great battle for life and property. And under the blessing of our Father, we will make the best of the future we can. The fire devastated the city almost destroying it completely. It destroyed over 200 homes and almost every business. 324 buildings in total were lost. And as the fire burned itself out, the winds ceased as instantly as they had begun. The damage was about $7 million worth in today's money. The Reverend again recalled, I never saw people labor more earnestly and yet hopelessly to save something from this awful storm of fire, and when all was lost, give it up without a word of complaint, and express gratitude to God that the lives of loved ones had been spared. And indeed, the city was near gone completely, but amazingly, not a single person out of the near 8,000 population of Yazoo City died. Everyone was spared. And after it was all over, long-time residents of the city remembered a long-distant threat that rose up in their conscience as the aftermath of the destruction settled into their souls. They remembered the witch. And although her name at the time very well may have been known, all records of the city were lost, and her name with it, nothing remaining of her other than a mysterious T.W. on her headstone. The morning after the fire, residents made their way to her grave, and to their great surprise, they discovered that the large chain around the grave had broken. Whoever T.W. was, the witch, apparently had broken the iron chain and made good on her promise to destroy the city 20 years to the day after her death. Her headstone was replaced by this one sometime in the 1990s. It then mysteriously fell and broke into three distinct pieces where it sits to this day. And in case you're wondering, the same thing I wondered when I first saw this headstone was, was it upside down when it fell? Nope, it wasn't. So I don't know, maybe it fell, broke into three pieces and then was neatly placed back the way it appears to be now, rather than trying to replace it or fix it, or maybe it was broken on purpose as a marketing stunt. I don't know. I'm just saying somebody must have put it that way in the ground. It didn't just fall and break that way. To be clear, the city did burn to the ground, and there was a legend about the witch before it did, and her grave is visited by tourists to this day, but I don't know how much of her legend is true and how much is embellished by author Willie Morris. Did she really predict the day Yazoo City would be destroyed and break the chains of her own grave that day? I don't know, but it makes for a good story. And Willie Morris knew how to write a good story. Because of him, her grave and her legend forever enshrined into the history of Yazoo City. In fact, his grave, he died in 1999, is just a few plots over from hers. And it says, 
even across the divide of death, friendship remains an echo forever in the heart. Today, Ve McGaw has played the witch on walking tours for 50 years. Ve refers to the witch as the person who was buried there because no one really knows who was buried there. The children refer to her as the chain lady. They will say, I'm not afraid of the chain lady. I'm not afraid of the chain lady. And a lot of time is spent protecting the chain, surrounding the grave from vandals. And some even think that if her chains were to break again, the witch would once again unleash her wrath upon the city. But some believe that the witch isn't actually buried there at all. In fact, an attempt earlier this year was made at excavating the witch's grave to see who was really there, but their request was politely denied by the city out of reverence and perhaps a little bit of superstition surrounding the witch. An interested party thinks that a man is buried there, and not just any man, a member of the Independent Order of Oddfellows. Never heard of them? Well, they're a fraternal order whose purpose aims to provide a framework that promotes personal and societal development to improve and elevate every person to a higher, nobler plane to extend sympathy and aid to those in need, making their burdens lighter, relieving the darkness of despair, to war against vice in every form, and to be a great moral power and influence for the good of humanity. The order was founded by Thomas Wildey in 1819, which was originally chartered by the Independent Order of Odd Fellows Manchester Unity in England going back to the early 1700s, and perhaps going back even further into the ancient days. And they have about 600,000 members worldwide today. Their symbol, three large chain links, representing love, truth, and friendship. Willie Morris, I've got my eye on you. Now make sure to like and subscribe or I'll haunt you in your sleep tonight.